So this is pretty cool article courtesy of RA and it's here. It features the headline that says it's definitely a harder grind. Is electronic music becoming inaccessible to the working class? And obviously being a working class individual myself and somebody from ENDS and somebody who definitely I would say occupies uh, a particular community of people who are into this sort of stuff right there's not many people out there i feel like who look like myself on a dance floor who are from the same background that i'm from who are from ends and grew up in a very rough tough neighborhood and kind of had to seek this stuff out as solace to kind of escape the mental hellhole of things i was going through day to day and kind of have a different you know attribution to that scene and what it's about and it holds a different special definitely a special place in my heart but it's also clearly things that kind of would stop certain people like myself from getting positions of like playing in certain places or you know being able to work in certain institutions just because of the level of access isn't necessarily there it's not really a it's not really an excuse but it just is what it is so it's quite cool to see these articles being put out there but i also don't want these articles to be as a, a way to kind of rewrite the wrongs by having some sort of um what do you call it um what's that word called by introducing some sort of weird rep reparations or uh, whatever else would be cool. I forgot there's another term for it, where you basically put things in place to benefit people from marginalized communities um, that, you know, really and truly kind of further the issue because you're not really rewarding people based on their talent or based on their flipping work, effort, whatever it may be called. You know what I mean? I don't want that to be cool. I don't want it to be picked for a thing because I'm black or from ends. That's not going to be gross. But also, the lack of representation in these places is a bit sad, but it is what it is. Let's, let's quickly spec over the article because I think it's really, really illuminating. It says here, um, according to new research, working class participation in the arts is on a decline. The joint study from Edinburgh, Manchester, Sheffield University found that the proportion of people from working class backgrounds operating in the creative industries has more than half since 1970, falling from 16.4% to just 7.9%. To be fair, that's always been the thing. Work, growing in a working class environment, especially in a working class conservative, very religious environment, you would know for the most part, it's very difficult to get your parents to agree um, or to endorse or to encourage you in a career in the arts because they don't necessarily see the value in it because for the most part the most value they see in things are things in the traditional fields such as stem right but they don't necessarily see what you can gain monetarily that will take you out from the pits of poverty and give them a car or give them a new house they can't see the idea of you drawing or you play music behind a booth is going to do that sort of stuff but they definitely see a change in people's way of life and quality of life when their kid becomes a doctor when their kid becomes a nurse when their kid becomes some sort of scientist or whatever it may be called all these things definitely go law or whatever it may be called these things definitely attribute to it so this stuff is something that's happening for a long long time but i'm assuming also now going forward with this economy that we're living in as well people are generally starting to kind of you know go go away from these kind of uh, volatile industries because when the pandemic came around the first industries to really suffer were the arts right and then the last industries to, to kind of come back from it and bounce back were the arts as well so they were basically held hostage by the whims of society and by the whims of culture and by the whims of the virus and whatever else it may be called so for sure if you're somebody with a creative mindset i can understand why you'd be like you know what forget the arts let me go something traditional because i know that's guaranteed i know it's gonna be solid it continues many feel that electronic music despite its roots in queer black and latino inner city communities has also shifted towards middle class homogeneity the dj and social media commentator uh alucio wilmoff how do you, how do you say his name Alu, aluicio wilmoff aka he valencia big up him i follow him on social media is a good follow um but these factors like declining record sales and dwindling tour revenues how and how we've combined to make more difficult artists to make a living having disproportionately affected those on working class backgrounds he says these days you've got to be able to do the whole media thing i feel like a lot of upper class middle class people have more money to throw parties and can pay for more stuff like pr they can um take the financial hit whereas with working class artists the only thing we really have is our art it's definitely a harder grind and most of us are looking for the it moment that has the potential to pull us into visibility i agree and don't agree i think the idea that you need a lot of money to start parties is a bit of a mis misnomer it's just harder to do i was throwing many many 
monthly sometimes weekly parties for a very very long time it's going on for five plus years in parts of east london and south london and i was you know didn't have much money sometimes i'd be throwing those parties to make money to allow me to afford things during a week that's how bloody broke i was during those times and those parties also opportunity of course to me to kind of further my self in terms of my dj career i kind of essentially started djing because of those parties i'd put together we'd kind of you know we were sort of, sort of some of the only i think promoters at that time back then who would actually pay people we didn't even make that much money of our parties because we only got split a 10 percent split from the bar spend after they made a thousand right so it's not that much money if you imagine you know your average bar makes about 500 pounds after cost of paying djs there's not a lot to be left with so we would still go out of our way to pay the person that we get got made, got to make the flyers pay the djs that were playing there so after a while we we couldn't afford to keep paying everybody so we started to play ourselves and that's how i I basically got to start DJing I put myself in the lineup and I'll kind of play the sort of like the early set where no one was there no one really cared and then by the time the real person who we booked come to play on the vibes were right the vibes were set they could come on smash and we kind of go home happy and we kind of did it just for the vibe just for the clout just for the notoriety of knowing oh hey i'm that person that puts that party which is absolutely sick and obviously it helped with the dj career a little bit but not really because i think a lot of people we book to play because i'm thinking about it looking back the people that we booked to play at our parties, some of them had their own raves and they rarely, if ever, booked us to play their raves, which is always annoying. Looking back on it, at the time, I didn't really notice it, but there was a bit of an in, imbalance in that regard. And I think maybe it becomes, it's more of a DJ thing, more of a clout industry thing. Everyone kind of is their own biggest fan. Everyone always thinks they're better than the next person. There's not a lot of kind of cooperation, collaboration and sharing. Everyone kind of keeps their gigs to themselves. They keep their booking agents to themselves, their contacts. I mean, there's not a lot of kind of free information sharing and kind of putting your arm around the shoulder of somebody and kind of bringing them in. It's a lot of like me on my own island. If I meet you there, I meet you there kind of thing no one's really helping each other out like look at the girls for instance right like there are some girls out there who are helping people out but for the most part a lot of those people are just kind of dog eat dog do you know what I mean like if I'm at the top I'm at the top if you're there you're there you have to kind of figure out in your own regard so that is probably hurting it more so than ever I feel like and I feel like the PR thing that's always been a thing though isn't it I feel like that applies to all industries you have to be everything nowadays you have to be everything like I think that for the longest time I could definitely say being somebody that's black and being someone from ends I always felt like you had to kind of do a bit more to be recognized, right? You, it's kind of something you always kind of grow up with, knowing that you can't just do bare minimum. I saw this clip going viral, some kid, I don't know what his name is, he's doing a tiny desk thing and he's singing and he's doing like some weird American crappy version of the streets. Uh, this kind of like, you know, spoken word rapping kind of thing and it sounds horrible. I think I tweeted something like, oh yeah, only white people can get away with being this mediocre, right? And having a career. And that's, I think, relatively true. It's kind of difficult to just be like this kitschy, weird, awkward, you know, um, um, self-diagnosed autism type of you know performer and kind of make it make it make it work when you're from ends and you look a certain way you kind of always have to try and do things a bit harder and a bit to another level to kind of really differentiate yourself and kind of really mark your way out of it thing so it can be difficult but i think for the most part it does serve the art it does help to kind of make the heart of a higher quality which is why most of the time myself included i feel like if given the opportunity you usually smash it because you're performing at such a high level when no one cares about you like for myself i'm thinking about it now what is it yeah let me check let's see yeah let's just see my soundcloud look at my soundcloud the latest mixes i put out maybe the two latest mix 17 days ago 28 plays <laughs> the one before that 12 and i think they're of good standard i feel like if i played these sets in a club no one would walk out no one would leave the dance floor no one would be like oh who is that amateur behind the decks i would sound exactly if not better than the people that they book at these places but am i playing there of course not but because you're already performing at this level i feel like when no one's watching you when you get the opportunity to perform there you end up really smashing it so sometimes all these things that we're doing just for the art where we're focusing on the art and we're kind of having to try harder than your regular counterparts it kind of helps the art when you end when you eventually have to go forward but the idea that you need money to put on events i think is a bit it's a bit false i think you know you could put on again it's more risk and it's hard to do because if anybody knows that's promoted before you know how much of a slog it is to get people to leave their house to come to an event it's flipping hard even if it's a free event it's really difficult to do that's why the people that are doing it at the highest level um people kind of run to them and try and get bookings and try and play there because they know to try and do it on their own it's going to be difficult 
So that's one thing. But I don't think price should price you out of it, to be honest. Um, it continues. Bristol DJ and producer Christian Jabs, aka Pessimist, echoes these sentiments, pointing to the widening gap between rich and poor as a direct obstacle for the working class people in electronic music. He says, if you're a young artist who happens to be from a less privileged background, then you're probably not going to have the time to focus solely on your music because you have work in full time. Meanwhile, there's a lot of mediocre talent about at the moment that has been propped up by the financial backing, family support, and the fact that these people people have the time on their hands to fully commit themselves yeah i can understand that i feel like this is where the nepotism argument comes in i said previously nepotism argument shouldn't be a argument to beat these nepotism babies with a stick behind their heads because they've been granted the flipping privilege and the gift of being born into the flipping tom hanks's family that's not their problems or their fault they didn't choose their parents it is what it is but what i think it should do is that it should give you some respite if you are a young actor coming up you should a bit be a bit more chill and a bit more calm if one of tom hanks's kids like a chet hanks for instance is a eternal fuck up and he's still getting presented with opportunities despite all these fuck ups and maybe obvious lack of talent it should be comforting to you to, to know that he's the son of tom hanks because then you can knock it cool he's been afforded some privileges some opportunities because he's a son of tom hanks that i'm never going to get because i'm just random person working two jobs and trying to support a family cool but it means my journey will be longer, but it also it also kind of makes me stop comparing myself to Chet Hanks because, you know, we're different leagues. I think the same thing happened to DJing. I've said it before, I think there needs to be an expose and nepotism, babies or privilege in general in terms of dance music industry because I think a lot of people have it confused. So I think with the Peggy Goo incident is a good example. The Peggy Goo story of her basically, you know, figuring out life in her mid-20s and living in berlin and chilling out and hanging out sort of stuff that would give you an idea of where that journey was able to kind of her kind of you know journey to become a global superstar dj was sort of shortened and her kind of ascent was kind of really super powered because she had these opportunities and privileges that most people don't have when you're going to berlin for the most part you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay your rent how you're going to afford dinner how you're going to you know choose it between drugs and alcohol whatever it may be but she got the opportunity to kind of you know figure stuff out in the real time work in certain places intern quote unquote all these things are things that can only be afforded if you have some financial backing or some support that can make you do these decisions and i feel like those things are good to know not because it's cool and funny to like pick apart people and insult someone like a pay you know i think it's good to know so that you can stop comparing yourself and your journey so you be like okay cool i can see that this girl got to where she got to because of these things helped her to kind of you know pursue the arts without having the struggle and the sort of uh, weight behind her head to kind of hold on to or to afford certain things she could kind of pursue arts 100 percent i am struggling in this point because i'm having to kind of you know divide my time between working this dead-end job that i hate and pursuing the arts my journey might be a bit longer it might take me more time but i'll eventually get there but i need to stop comparing myself to her because that journey is completely different and a bit of a bit of an exception to the rule for the most part but i don't but again it doesn't excuse the position really that's not an excuse it's not for you to say oh yeah woe is me that's why i'm not there you still need to work hard and kind of you know do what you need to do on your side of things putting out the mixes releasing stuff making new records you know whatever it may be but again i think a part of it as well there's this kind of purposeful mystique around the industry right about how to get gigs how to get how to go forward that kind of doesn't help things either like who do what do you go to do you try and get a manager first do you try and get a booking agent first do you try and put out a track first do you send your demos to people do you let the people find your demos yourself do you upload mixes online do you stream them online do you put like what do you do like there's all this kind of misdirection and purposeful kind of vagueness around stuff and you know these there's a common thing here people say especially people that made it oh just trust the process it will come with no 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 stuff some stuff has to happen that that kind of gets your ball rolling break it down let's be real and let's get to the point of it that's what can really help people right? people purposely kind of hide it and kind of hide their hands and hide their process because you know people are generally selfish and don't want other people to get opportunity because the last thing you want is to be inundated in the scene full of amazing djs because again it's going to limit your opportunities to get gigs as well because you know part of the reason why you make it is because there's loads of shit people out there who are professional so if you're half decent you're going to be able to smash it so it's a bit you know it's a bit twofold it continues jabs recently took up work as a painter and decorated to make ends meet portrays the british sorry the bristol scene as increasingly homogenized he says when i was coming up in around 2010 it was a night and day compared to what it's like now bristol has become such a divided city both racially and by class and the dance music scene really reflects that 
Jabs blames the division on hypergentrification, insisting that for the most part, dance music has been reduced to little more than commodity to the city's large, uh, predominantly affluent student population, therefore alienating those living outside the student bubble. Yeah, for sure. This is definitely a very unique UK problem, though, and I feel like I definitely understand where he's coming from, but I don't think it applies globally, but definitely a very unique problem. I can see why hypergentrification could push people from marginalized underrepresented um you know um places to not maybe pursue stuff in the arts because it's so far away but i've also seen areas where for the most part you look at stuff like business techno you look at stuff like tech house even for instance and it feels like a lot of that has kind of been birthed from people from you would say the working class who have maybe you know pushed them ways up towards middle class to be represented in some way shape or form and the funny thing about that is that that is also a bit of a whitewash industry right it's a bit white washed it's a bit working class but it's also very different to any other scene we have here in the uk it's all kind of exists this own little bubble um but i definitely do see way more girls i see definitely see way more black people so it's a bit strange like you would assume a lot of those people in that industry or in that scene are probably not the most um you know uh not the most um affable when it comes to the lgbtq queer community but they also have way more representation in their scene than we have in our quote-unquote scene in techno right you just see the same whitewashed lineups you see the same um names on the places wherever they're going to play there's not a representation at all if ever on the lineups it's all kind of the same old nonsense regurgitate all over again there's not a lot of dynamism in the tracks and songs like it's all a bit similar similar but hey what kind of it continues preston born artist rainy miller acknowledges a similar disconnect between students and the local population in his hometown but where Bristol is renowned for its vibrant music scene, the bigger issue faced by the working class people in towns like Bristol is gaining access to culture at all. It says, realistically, outside of a metropolis, I don't see much funding or much happening in these smaller satellite towns. These places where majority of ordinary working class people live have become cultural vacuums. Accessibility wise, I think the most important thing is showing people the culture and getting them excited about it. People seemingly aren't being given the opportunity to explore these areas and a lot of the time they aren't even aware that it exist miller also highlighted the issue of fetishization describing how hyper local working class cultures subcultures are either ridiculed or ignored until they eventually co-opted by the cultural gatekeepers and repackaged to the masses of course we know that that always happens it continues look at clubs now when you hear donk is usually done unironically he explained making reference to the once derided hard house dub um long detached from its small town like your roots people view it as a joke but it's reality is one of the only things that has been able to ferment and grow in these places it's now being sold back and almost like a commodity yeah think of possession isn't it i understand where he's coming from miller used the example of bad boys chiller crew the bradford collective now signed sony subsidiary relentless records who have offered a humorous caricature the baseline garage subculture that's originated from yorkshire obviously sort of as a gimmick but these were lads doing the kind of thing all over the country 10 years earlier back then it wasn't a joke it was what people grew up on for sure for lorraine james who grew up in the alma estate of north london imposter syndrome was the biggest obstacle she tried um to make a name for herself in the predominantly white middle class experimental music circuit she says i didn't think i'd ever be in a position that i'm in now you just sort of do things you do you just you just sort of do these things to fail <laughs> she's speaking my language <laughs> you put it out there and it goes into the flipping dark web or into the urethra or into deep space we feel like and especially these mixes or these online streams <laughs> i think what's my online stream got three hundred thousand, no 300 views or something like that you're like jesus christ what is the point but it continues even when i started bubbling up in 2018 i still feel like i was winging it i had nothing to fall back on and was basically entering the unknown you don't get a stable wage every month and i'm not from a rich background so it was really very very scary thing james reference a sort of music equipment and soberly faced by artists who use minimal setup as additional challenge oh yeah don't get me started on the flipping controller vibe because who would you see in clubs with controllers predominantly people from working class environments right that couldn't afford cdjs at home so they had to play on flipping controllers but then they get to a club they bring the controller and they'd be you know have the ravers look at them like they're flipping amateurs and have the people playing alongside them looking at them like amateurs right so this kind of you know nonsense flipping circle is kind of being permeated by the brands themselves who are making this equipment and pricing out people like myself who are from working class environments and you have the people that are in the industry the gatekeepers upholding the standard that if you don't play on these big cdjs and you're not a real dj it's like go and spin on my middle finger it continues electronic artists who make a living from music tend to have thousands of pounds worth of gear at their disposal which can be pretty intimidating 
there's also a lot of judgment in the electronic music scene uh, over how much or little gear you have. Sometimes when I'm sound checking, I bring two MIDI controllers <laughs> with my laptop and the sound guy will look at me like, is that it? But I've always said that it's what you do with it, just work with what you've got. Of course, that's, that's the kind of Casey Neistat um, approach. When Casey was doing his vlogs, his daily vlogs and whatnot, there'd be tons of people online, especially asking him those annoying questions about equipment, about equipment. And for the most part, I think he felt it too. They was asking his questions about equipment because I think in a weird way, it was like a backhanded compliment because it was like, oh, you're only this good because you have the best equipment. And he was like, no, 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 no. It's not the equipment. It's what you do with the equipment. This is what I use. And this is my flow. It's my process. And this is what I'm thinking of when I'm shooting certain things. But it's never about the equipment. It's about what you do with what you have. So use what you have. Don't fetishize or obsess over getting the right thing. And you'll be great. And I know for myself, I learned to DJ primarily off of belt drive CDJs. Sorry, belt drive um, turntables. I think I had like, um, what brand I had? I've got a name of it, but some of you know, it's not Technics, it's the other one. I had those. I never owned a Technics 1210s, legit ones, never. Then I went from that to using a really shitty Newmark. I said Newmark, I think. I think I had Newmark belt drives. Then I went from using a Newmark belt drive to play vinyl. Vinyls that I was buying from a charity shop and secondhand shops I was playing out. So then I'd use a flipping MIDI controller, a really old Newmark MIDI controller, like a big, massive brown, I think it was grey. I took that MIDI controller to go and play one of my first gigs that I got booked as a DJ solo by myself in the Shoreditch Art Gallery somewhere and i think there's the same dj gig where i played alongside <laughs> um crystal clear he was actually he was booked at the same time as all well, just bizarre but i was playing on these flipping big things and i didn't have to play on cdjs before that and i was happening crazy imagine playing with a flipping white macbook with a controller playing next to flipping mashup um not mashup um crystal clear crazy but anyway continues um while they're being um the article on Tears here says, while there have been concessious efforts to tackle dance music's lack of diversity in recent years, Wilmoth believes that the scene's over-reliance on this diversity quotas at which, at least in their current form, has hindered any serious change. Ah, oh, yes, I like this. Our understanding of representation politics is pretty hollow and surface level. When people talk about inclusion and identity, that should also include class. The conversation tends to stop at race, gender, and its sexuality, but people need to realize that all these things are interwoven. But that's the issue, though, when you get into identity politics. It doesn't end. Because if you go to class, you have to then split class up because not all working class people are created equally, right? You have to then go down to do that. And you have to go down, you know, it just, it just goes, it's just too much. It's just too much. Overall, I've always said it's a real disappointment and it kind of it kind of bums you out when you start going out a lot like i do and you start to realize that for whatever reason whatever scene you're in the dance the people behind the booth usually don't represent the crowd it's really annoying and i see it a lot of times especially with stuff that i'm not into especially edm think of edm right Think of all those hot girls you see in fishnet tights, in leather, in whatever it may be called, like stunting and showing out, going to EDM, raves, going to Burning Man, going to Tomorrowland, all these things, right? Think of all those girls. Now think of how many of those girls you've seen play behind the decks. How many of those girls are DJs and artists? How many girls get the opportunity to play warm-up sets or whatever? Not many. You see the same old white guy looking face, like, you know, I don't know what they look like. You know, that kind of haircut, whatever, with the big t-shirts and wearing Balenciagas on top of a DJ booth dancing, right? That's all you see. So for every reason, even on the most niche level, in the most underground level, the crowds never represent people behind the booths. And in the most commercial high class commercial normie type of cringy level in edm the crowds don't represent are not represented in the dj booth which is probably why these new sort of alternative scenes and spaces pop up especially here in the uk with you know homo tash and like um, inferno and we're like howl and even pussy palace that's why probably those places and even stuff like um what's it called uh um I don't know, I've got the other ones, but there's loads of them anyway. That's why those things are probably popping up so much because they're one of the first things that we've seen that are representative of the scenes or the people that they're kind of communicating with. Like they have a lot of queer LGBTQ type people represented behind the booths. Some of them are very unknown. Some of them don't have any social media platform whatsoever. Some of them are just kind of people that are just attending the raves and got friendly with the promoters and stuff or people that put their events on. So there's a clear link between it. It's all kind of it's a cyclical thing. Whereas all these other scenes, it's just the same old people, the same established name being cycled every single season. Look at Time Warp, the most boring, predictable lineup you see every single year. The same names, the same faces all the bloody time and it gets boring after a while so that kind of you know representation quota type of thing is a bit hard because diversity and representation isn't being 
um, seen in all of the different sort of rungs on the dance music industry, in my opinion. It's all kind of the same. It's all vanilla. It's all boring. It's all crappy. Um, and there's no real change. There's no real, it feels like owners to kind of change things in general. They just keep repeating the same thing because it works. He added, for example, if you're putting three minorities on a lineup with one well-established white headliner, nine times out of 10, the headliner will be earning the most and the other artists are viewed as parsley, um, sprinkled on top of a promoters to kind of look good. Yeah, but no one's doing it still. I don't, I can't figure the last time I've heard of a big white established headliner being supported by free people from minorities playing. It still doesn't happen that often. So even if it is done to be performative, um, it still is not happening enough. And even if it was to be happen, it wouldn't be exactly a bad thing because I don't think the opportunity to play is the most important thing because like I said, in this industry, people purposely try to obfuscate or hide the process of trying to get to the top no one really knows how to get there. It's all kind of a bit misty and a bit mysterious on purpose. So these things are still good, in my opinion. Instead, Wilmoth wants to see greater focus on policy to help minorities on a material level. He also advocates for greater transparency around artist fees and financial apparatus required to gain the foot in the scene. A lot of stuff just is a tool. That ain't going to happen. You're not going to see people's transparency in terms of artist fees. We already see how the flipping scene went up in the uproar when that article came out about flipping Solomon and you found out that he was earning what he was earning. It's like, what What did you expect? Solomon's one of the biggest well-known commercial DJs out there. Of course, he's going to be earning like 200, 100,000 plus as a DJ fee. That makes complete sense, especially when you can also consider on top of it, he's not even one of those kind of like, just turn up and do his thing and go. He's legitimately a fan of the music. He's, you know, he, he plays for hours on end. He's one of the most high profile people I can think of that has that old school German, European, Berlin type of mentality when it comes to DJ sets, right? Like two hours is never enough. He's going for a marathon set. So if you're a promoter, you're definitely getting your bang for your buck because you can extrapolate as much value out of him as possible to kind of get your money back from what you paid in the artist's fee. And also just from terms of a, you know, equation vibes, he definitely earns his money for the t amount of time that he plays there, especially com in comparison to other people who turn up for two hours, play the top 50 bangers from Beatport and then dip and still get maybe, you know, an exorbitant amount in terms of money. So I don't think those people want to be, I don't think they'd want the public to know how much they get paid because people are going to require more from what they do. And I also don't think the promoters want to know how much they're willing to pay these people to play at these places because it's going to throw, you know, it's going to skewer their whole pay structure completely. So no, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But what are the consequences for the scene that's risk becoming an exclusive playground for the privilege? Things will get very boring and formulaic, says Wilmoth. You can kind of see it already happening. You go to TikTok and you're seeing techno artists that you've associated with more underground clubs playing alongside EDM acts at big festivals. In a class, in a class sense, people get rewarded for buying into this very homogenized industry thing and for adhering to a certain formula and all end up sounding very familiar sorry very similar there are um, there needs to be more space for the actual futurism that dance music once portrayed itself jabs who according to his twitter bio is extremely bored of dance music scene goes one further it's like um it's maybe a bit of extreme statement but i personally don't feel like there's any interesting grassroots movements coming out of dance music at the moment the scene has become overwhelmed with entitled people and it's stuck in this really boring place as the results of that that said james thinks actually let's go on that comment that's true. That could be said for every, every single subculture and industry and niche and scene out there. Fashion, design, art, they're all boring. They're all homogenized and they're all stale at the moment. But I think these moments are also times that you can kind of counteract and create something quite out there and something fresh and something cool that could come out of it for sure. People are going to respond to these things all the time. It gets stale, then it gets good and it gets fun once again. Just got to give it time. That said, James thinks aspiring working class artists shouldn't give up. I do think the environment, the electronic music scene um, is becoming more accessible. For example, every now and then you come across a huge hit that has been made by some 30 year old bedroom producer. It's an improvement for when I was at school, but at the same time, I don't think the government cares. They don't want to grant working class kids having nice things. I'm not waiting for the government to give me an excuse or to give me permission to make music personally. That's just me. And I feel like most people, most kids out there, working class kids for general, you're definitely self um self-sufficient i know i was when i was growing up you just figure stuff out like i said before i was playing alongside master plex or master plex alongside flipping crystal castle crystal clear i was like i can't even speak today i was playing alongside crystal castle on lineup many years ago using a flipping dj controller i figured it out and i think most kids now the profession with the accessibility of um you know um, equipment out there with places like pirate studios that exist that you can go and play 
on a professional setup similar to what you see in nightclubs and all your DJ heroes and idols playing on a weekly basis. So there are little to excuses anymore in terms of having the ability to play and access these things. Now to get into the industry, that is still, I feel like a gatekeepery purposeful, let me kind of try and stand in front of this and not let people through type of thing. And I think everyone's to blame. I think even the working class people who push through, there's very rarely a lot of them that come back and sort of like offer their hand and pull people up. You don't see that happening too often. I don't know why that is, but for every reason, you don't really see a lot of the arm around the shoulder of somebody to kind of bringing them through. There's a lot of kind of me on my own. I do my thing. If I've got my label, I bring people through, but it's very much like me, my own person, me, my own hero type of vibe. And especially, like I said, with the ladies, you see a lot of the ladies, like think of some of the biggest girls out there, especially within the techno underground type of scene. There's a lot of them on their own. There's not a lot of them, you know, rolling around in crews, in kind of collectives and stuff. It's all solo dolo girls like behind decks with their little arms waving around the air, having a good time. But they're very rarely bringing together or bringing up, uplifting these women voices who clearly need the attention on them. When you think about how, you know, dominated male, you know, male, male DJs are in the industry overall. So it's definitely an issue being affected everywhere altogether. If anything, there should be more kind of clarity more transparency in terms of how to get the gigs how to go forward and these type of things but there should be more work as well done by the clubs themselves to kind of you know um establish and kind of pull in people who are maybe not that well known and kind of get them involved and kind of get them to play you look at places like fold for instance that's around the corner from where i live and they do a really good job of kind of getting their local community involved with the stuff they do with unfold i still think they should be doing more i uh, look me myself like you know i'm from flipping canning town and custom house and i've never played there and that place is legitimately five minutes away from where i was bloody born and i'm sure there's many people out there as well that are you know that are from the area that would love a chance to play those type of places and you don't instead they fly over people from other countries to come and play which is a bit annoying but at least they're doing something with that regard you see fabric doing the same thing with their resident dj they're trying to do something but more needs to be done and i feel like it needs to it's a collective effort it's not everybody's it's not it's not one person's fault but everybody needs to kind of play a part in it to kind of make the scene fresh again. But I still think even if no one does that and everyone holds their hands, you know, um, hold, holds their hands or put their hands in their pockets and doesn't open up doors and stuff, I still think the kids will respond and they'll figure a way out and they'll figure a way through and they'll figure a, a, a solution because it always happens. Every single generation, every single era we see it, it stagnates, it gets boring, it gets crappy and the kids burst through regardless because that's what kids are meant to do. But to figure out, especially if you've got a passion for something, you'll definitely definitely figure it out and find a way to carve yourself a lane in those situations i know i'm trying to do so in my own regard i'm sure people are doing do so in their own regard also going forward so it's cool to see these conversations being highlighted and put out there but i don't want them to be like an excuse to not to try and to throw your hand up in the air and say what's the point because i don't have any rich parents because you can still make it forward you can still make it through it just requires a little bit more hard work a little bit more dedication a little bit more insights in it but you can do it you can do it